Oh, hello. Come on in. It's time for our holiday story. Now, my name is Lance, and on this channel, we do some things that are called into question often. Some say we take coffee a little too seriously. We take things a little too far, and guess what? They're probably right. Today's video, what we're going to do is we're gonna take a look at the year in hindsight and we can make some recommendations on a little things that you might wanna consider if data-driven is something you want to be. Now, normally I'm not one to be happy when someone decides to capitalize off of an idea that I have or off of a result of a test that I have. I made a video earlier this year where I took a look at the effects of slow feeding your grinder, and I said it was an immediate improvement if you just have the patience. But of course, a lot of people were quick to point out that consistency was an issue if you were not skilled enough to dump those beans in in a meticulous fashion at a very specific grams per second rate, which I agree, that can make sense. If you're, you know, less coordinated than I, this company who makes nice little accessories. They've done things for the DF series over the years. Now, although the attachment really only fits those types of grinders, it can be really put on anything. It doesn't really matter. All you need is the hole down below and you need the consistency of the feed. So this is what that is. When you click the button, it takes some beans and it just plops it right in the little hole and then bloop, 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 you slow feed your grinder and you're right on your way to Tasty Town. Now, if you might be questioning, slow feeding my grinder is not gonna change the way those burrs crush the beans, you would be mistaken, my friend. And in fact, what we're going to do is link right here, the video that goes over this in a bit more depth, but also I have upcoming data that will be shared in a future video of slow feeding your grinder versus not using particle size distribution, because like I said, we take things maybe a little too far here. We shook up extraction this year in an unprecedented fashion with a simple test. Now this test was meant to just look at different distribution techniques that have been shared and loved by home baristas around the world. And the inspiration of this came from Barista Hustle years ago doing something similar when they were testing things like the NCD. But we wanted to see what was proved to be the most efficient as well as most consistent. And what we found was the blind shaker just shaking things up a bit was the most consistent and most efficient way of extraction. Now, a lot of people wanted to say that there was some sort of ulterior motive for including this or for having it win. Well, of course, I don't manipulate the data, so it won on its merit. The ironic thing is, I wasn't even including this in the test. It's once I was pushing across my ideas to Dr. Samo Smirke, who is a coffee researcher in Zurich, he said, you should add the Weber shaker to that lineup. It's what we use in our labs here. I think it does better than WDT and the others. And I said, bet, I will add it. So it wasn't even in my original testing idea, the original methodology, but it came in as a dark horse and won the hearts of millions, not really, but it won my heart and I use it religiously. One of the main benefits of using this type of shaker is the way the grounds fall out of the shaker. So you wanna be able to drop it from a bit of a height. Even if it's just a tall funnel, that is better than dropping it directly on top. So what S-Works did is they created a built-in funnel into the system. So whenever you drop your grounds, you are going from a height. Now you can of course remove the bulk of this and there we have it, but we still have a little bit of a height, though it's not as significant as when you add on this additional piece. Now there are quirks with this one. There are lots of O-rings in here. Granted, you can remove those, but it makes it a much more contained system and a bit more, I guess, annoying to kind of pop out. And in the inside, there's an O-ring in this as well. And while there is criticism on the price of something like this or like this, you have people buying 50 to $100 WDTs. You have people buying spinning WDTs that show to be less than ideal when compared to just shaking. So I guess take that all with a grain of salt. But of course, we're being data driven. Okay, all right, let's move on to the next. Now I made another video where I pulled loads of data and you know, had some conclusions there. And my conclusion was of course, getting yourself a really nice self-leveling tamper. 
I did not recommend for the force tamper because there was a lot of variation in the tamps. Now, a lot of people don't care because they love the satisfying click of the force tamper, which is completely understandable. In cafes, people prefer to use just normal tampers. You may not get as perfect of tamps every single time uh, with something that does self-leveling, but it is something that has no retention possibility. With these other types of tampers, you can get coffee stuck up underneath the little crevices, and that can be not ideal for a cafe environment. This one is okay. This is a version three, but the issue is, is this plate can be a little wobbly, so you can still tamp a bit unlevel, a bit unevenly with it. You still need to pay attention to going straight up and down. But what I have found to be my favorite is Happy Tampers. Now the Happy Tamper doesn't really have any wobble side to side, and it is very easy to tamp straight down using your palm, just like so. I have the Bigfoot kind of accessory on the bottom because I found there was some suction with their original base. And based off my video where I discussed that, I'm happy to say that the creator of Happy Tamper created a new base that doesn't have that suctioning issue. The aesthetics may not be the best. I'm not a big fan of the massive Happy Tamper and the numbers everywhere, but uh, it is a great option. I did a test recently where I was sifting out fines to see how it affected flavor. Whereas it cannot make cheap grinders compete with more expensive grinders, it can greatly improve your experience with cheaper grinders so you don't have to immediately upgrade to a more expensive grinder. I don't remember you doing a video on this. Well, it's because I didn't do a video on this. Instead, in the video, I used a shimmy from Fellow. But those are unnecessarily expensive when you can get the same thing on AliExpress that was around before the shimmy for a tenth of the price or something. This is a dosing cup with a lid that has a 200 micron sifter inside, and it's a nice little thing to have. Shake your booty, give it a couple taps, and then you'll have your fines kind of situated in here, and you'll have the bulk of your coffee still right here. It's impossible to sieve out all fines because of the static that there is holding fines to boulders, but this is an easy and cheap way to kind of improve your pour overs if you believe you have a grinder that's more espresso focused and produces more fines than you're comfortable with in your pour over. Say you have something like a J Max, which is a fantastic hand grinder for espresso, you want a little bit of the fines out. You give a couple of little shicky shakes, and guess what? You'll have a bit higher clarity. If you shake too much, your brew can turn hollow, but of course I went over all of that in my recent video on sifting out fines. People have been, you know, yammering on about puck screens for a few years now. Honestly, it seemed like the biggest kind of introduction to the market with puck screens came from the Flare 58, though I'm sure there were people using them on threads earlier than that. But the fact that Flare 58 came out with one, that was the first time I really saw it discussed heavily about three years ago. I did a whole video on puck screens, and it does seem that a top puck screen can improve your extraction. You can get a cheap ultrasonic little bath for jewelry that you can get for 50 bucks online if you want to keep them clean. You can soak them in kafiza. You can use a steam wand to help clean it out. But these do a really nice job, though they are kind of a pain in the bum to clean. You may ask, well, what about these little billet screens? They're easier to clean. They're not as effective as the mesh screen is as regards efficiency. When it comes to extraction, I think they're about the same as nothing. But if you have a super high water debit, it can help maintain the structure of your puck underneath all of that flow. They keep your shower head much cleaner so you have less worrying with coffee oils and different things getting into your machine. Everything that I'm talking about here is backed by data. I'm not here trying to get you to extract at 28, 29% extraction. I actually don't believe in higher extraction is better taste, especially not to the extent that some people preach it. Instead, what I like to see is a higher efficiency of extraction, which I believe to be very important, especially in espresso. Now in filter coffee, because we're just using percolation, we're using gravity for water to go through grounds, I don't believe efficiency to be nearly as important. Immersion is very efficient, but it doesn't taste nearly as good to me as filter coffee, which is inherently a lot more stratified and skewed. In pour over brewing, bed depth is of the utmost importance. You don't want to get too deep, don't get me wrong, but too shallow and you're going to get a hollow brew that tastes over extracted as well as under extracted and you're like, what the frick happened? Let's start with the V60. If we put seven grams in a V60 versus a Kafek, the Kafek sits about here, okay? A V60 would sit right down here. 
Now let's take the April, which is known to have a very wide base and is very flared out sides. These both kind of combine in order to make a much wider, more shallow bed. So if I put a 20 gram dose in here, it would be equivalent to like a five gram dose inside of the Cafe Deep 27. And I just don't prefer those types of brews. They tend to be hollow, kind of like this weird over under extracted type situation that goes on. With an Aurea, because it has a much smaller center and much more intense angle than the April, you can get away with a smaller dose, but even still, due to these things, a 20 gram dose is still only going to sit about this much of bed depth, whereas a five gram dose in here is gonna give you about that much bed depth. All of these have kind of an ideal bed depth where they're gonna perform the best. Like with the Kafek, I don't think over 10 grams, really even 10 grams, seems to be too much for this brewer. When you have too much of a bed depth, there comes an issue, and you may have noticed this when you're trying to do massive brews with a pour over. People say, can you give me a recipe with the V60 for 40 grams or a Chemex 60 gram recipe? And it's because people aren't able to find success with those. And I think it's because those are simply too big for those brewers. When you get into those ranges, you need something more like a batch brewer that has a really big bed in order to make that bed depth more shallow relative to what they would be in something like a V60. My recipes are six grams of coffee, I'm going up to 100 grams of water. Seven grams, around 115 grams of water. Eight grams, around 125, maybe 130 grams of water. And we're gonna essentially pour and not raise the bed too, too high. We're just doing small pours to allow essentially as little bypass as possible because this is gonna to wanna to drain as quickly as it can. We're gonna start that timer and I'm just gently pouring it right in the center. I'm not going to the edges at all, just right in the center up to about 20 grams. And I'm just letting it sit. I don't wanna to do too much of a bloom because you see how fast it's going through. That's gonna be very low TDS. We don't wanna waste a lot of water on the bloom because it's just gonna go right through it. At about that 30 second mark, I'm gonna do a bit more water, another 20 gram pour. And the idea here is to really upset that bed and to ensure that we are furthering along the diffusion. Now that those grounds are nicely saturated, even though the water's not made it all the way to the center, we're able to start getting some nicer extraction, and you see that reflected in the darker color coming into the decanter itself. Now after those first two brews, once we hit a minute, we're at about 40 grams, I'm gonna be a bit more liberal with my pours. I'm not gonna wait and be as intense about time. I'm gonna more so let the bed dictate to me what it wants. I don't want the water level too high, so I'm gonna go until it hits about where, the, about where I was at its highest peak. I'm gonna let it drain a bit, and then I'm gonna go back in. I'm at about 65 grams right now. I'm gonna go back in, do it again. Just flurrying up that bed a little bit every time. The more we flurry it up, the more efficient that water is going to be able to interact with all of those grounds, and it's gonna give us a nice fuller extraction that tastes a lot better. I found when I fill up too much, that I can get a bit more watery brews, a little bit more hollow. It doesn't taste nearly as good. I want that water to pass straight up through those coffee grounds as much as possible. And then we pour it all the way to 115. Now we just wait. So as you see, I didn't use too much of the filter. When it's a seven gram dose, I only go about halfway up. If I did more, you know, it might go up a little bit more, a little bit more, depending on the depth of that bed. But the final drawdown, we're about there. We're at two minutes and we're done, 220. 100 grams. It's just like if you did a one to five ratio, a lingerie type of espresso. But these are, oh, that's so good. This was not very data driven of me, but the other ones all have videos of their own. If you would like to go and take a look at those, they were all linked and I'll put them down in the caption as well. If you enjoy what you see, please hit the like and subscribe. Check out my Patreon. Let's have some fun in my Discord. Anyway, I thank you so much. It's been a wonderful year. I hope you have a wonderful holiday season and uh, wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much, and uh, that's it for me. I'm gonna drink this tasty Esmeralda Gesha, and I hope that you brew something tasty today. And cheers. You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. You really are a heel. You're as prickly as a cactus. You're as spiny as an eel, Mr. Grinch. I wouldn't touch you with a... Thirty-nine and a half foot pole!